Okay, hello again, everyone. My name is Holly Ross. I'm the very, I'd say, recently new executive director over at the Drupal Association. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today for the first in a webinar series. Uh, we're really excited to get this going today, and we're really pleased to have all of you with us. Thanks for your patience while we made sure we got as many people as possible connected before we got underway. Today's webinar is Drupal 8 and Spark. Simplify Responsive Design, mobile. Uh, and our presenters today are Kevin O'Leary and Jesse Beach. Um, and I think, Kevin, you're going to get us started. Sure. Um, so, great. Um, so I, uh, let me just hop over to, um, to, my, to my keynote here. Um, so um, today we're going to talk about, um, you know, what we've been doing in Spark uh, in terms of uh, improving um, both Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 uh, for mobile, um, uh, starting with um, you know the content author, who's um, uh, the real focus of Spark. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about Spark first before I, I, I go into mobile, um, and uh, you know uh, really dig into the details there. The Spark is um, Spark is a distribution. But it's not really a distribution in this in the sense that distributions are usually, um, you know, uh, made by um, you know companies who are uh, uh, making things in Drupal, like Drupal Commerce, or you know, a lot of these other distros that have a kind of a specific business purpose. Spark is really um, uh, something that uh, that 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 we initiated here at Acquia that Dries really wanted to. Um, Put together to focus on just generally improving the content authoring experience for 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 all of Drupal in Drupal 7, and because um, the release cycle of Drupal um, takes quite a lot of time, we wanted to have a, a, a place where we could take you know some real you know um, usability improvements um, and code improvements and move them into this distribution that would be sort of almost like a, you know, a, a place where we could, we could prove out and test you know, some of the best um, concepts uh, in usability and design and, um, and development so that we could get them kind of on deck for the next, uh, the next release of Drupal. Um, and that's really what, what it's all about. It's, again, focused mainly on the authoring experience um, and just improving uh, Drupal's uh, overall usability and not necessarily focused on any kind of specific industry vertical or business purpose. And one of our hopes is that has always been that we could, um, you know, that other, that other people out there would take Spark and then use it as kind of the baseline or kind of foundation for their own distributions um, so that they would all kind of inherit those, those great uh, usability features. So um, uh, why content authoring and how does that relate to mobile? Um, content authoring uh, is, has been our focus because you know, uh, as we looked out across the landscape of um, all the other competitive CMSs, um, you know, back about a year ago when we first started working on Spark, um, and some some people who have seen some of Greece's presentations or 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 or, uh, or my previous webinars will have maybe seen some of this um, before. But we looked at uh, a WordPress CQ5. You're not sharing your screen, Kevin. I'm I'm not sharing my screen. I'm told. Uh -huh. A good thing. Hold on one second. Uh, here, my desktop. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you didn't really miss anything in my slides. <laughs> there, it was really pretty much just. Um, uh, excuse me. Just yeah, go back here. Um, yeah, what is Spark and why content authoring, content authoring and how does that relate to mobile? Um, and uh, again, so um, uh, we started looking at our um, at competitive um, content management systems, both proprietary and uh, and open source, and um, you know uh, put together these uh, spider graphs, which kind of illustrate you know where we were falling behind or where the deficiencies of Drupal uh, were and where the strengths of Drupal were. So, uh, so in the technical area, Drupal was very strong against a lot of the other uh, CMSs. But um, in the in the area of authoring experience, um, a lot of the um, a lot of the other systems were really, really uh, kind of killing us. 
WordPress always has you know, been well known for uh, a good content authoring experience. Squiz and Plone, uh, some smaller um, you know, CMSs have, have made some real advances in that area in terms of uh, in-place editing. NCQ5 uh, is a big um, proprietary um, competitor that also has some really good authoring experience. Um, so then we looked at these various different areas. Obviously, what we're talking about today is mobile authoring, and you can see here that you know we we are we were well we were well behind in that area when we first started looking at Spark. Um, what we're going to show you today is that we've really kind of you know come a long way since then. So our goal uh, from the get-go was to you know build uh, as Angie says a kick-ass authoring experience for Drupal 7 so that people can use it now. And then, um, as I was mentioning earlier, and then sort of have those improvements on deck uh, to be ported into Drupal Core. And we've actually done that. We've, done, we've, we've put a lot of them into Drupal Core, and Jesse's going to demo you know, a lot of those things that we've been working on in just a minute. Um, so uh, so the, the audience uh, for Spark, who will use Spark? I kind of touched on that a little bit already. In terms of you know we really it's it's everybody it's not any specific industry vertical it's it's all users of Drupal um, but particularly the users of Drupal who are who are doing the managing of the content on a day-to-day -day basis so this is a content management system so you know the content author is really the pe the person who we should be giving sort of the the you know the king's chair to here um, and uh, and 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 uh, uh, in terms of who's working on Spark. Uh, this is the team. Um, obviously, Dries is, um, you know, intimately involved in everything that we're doing. Um, Angie is 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 managing the day-to-day -day, uh, um, project. Um, that's me, the third one there. Um, Kevin, I am uh, I'm I'm leading up the UX and uh, and designing, you know, a lot of new types of patterns. Preston uh, has been prototyping uh, for us, uh, doing HTML and JavaScript prototypes. Wim Leers uh, in Belgium is um, uh, um, uh, one of the is one of the key um, developers behind Edit in Place. Uh, Gabor, who you probably uh, are very familiar with, um, is 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 also um, developing a lot of the the nitty gritty back end stuff. And Jesse is working primarily on uh, front end development, but uh, also on uh, you know a lot of the really the application development now. Uh, and Darmesh. Uh, is is testing uh, everything that we do, um, and Darmesh has actually been testing a lot of other things in Drupal as well. Not just uh, not just stuff that Spark has has been working on, but 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 just uh, Drupal in general. Going back as far as the uh, Minnesota usability study, he's been really intimately involved with Drupal. Um, so what's on the roadmap? Um, we've got um, content creation and editing uh, is very important, uh, obviously primary to what we're talking about. And then uh, dashboards and workflow, which we've spent a little bit of time on. Mobile, which we're going to be talking about today. Uh, but then also, um, you know, going forward, we're going to be getting into much more heavily into media, uh, as well as content staging and localization. Actually, we're um, just starting to kick off a real big localization project, taking the work that Gabor's done and bringing that forward uh, with better usability. Um, so we uh, content uh, creation and editing um, a lot has been done in D8 core and also in Spark, uh, in the Drupal 7 version of Spark. So as we do these things, as we make improvements like edit module, um, we are backporting all of those things. Actually, also Theodore Baidala, um, uh, Nod is another um, contributor who has been working on the on the team um, intermittently, and uh, he's been he's done a lot of work in backporting those things uh, into D7. So you have edit module, you have toolbar uh, in D7 now. Um, yeah, I think it's worth noting that we actually devote 20% of our of our time every week to backporting. So that's right. Yeah, we have we have a full day. Um, that's correct. Jesse is, um, um, you know, pointing out that we have a we actually have a D7 day that's um, that's entirely devoted to um, to just working on D7, and uh, we're not entirely focused on D8. Although, you know, the D8 stuff is obviously because we're you know, right in the middle of the cycle, very, very, very key. But um, so mobile authoring, a lot of the improvements that we've done in D8 core uh, in terms of mobile authoring, and uh, we and others also um, have been have been ported back into D7. Um, media management, we're still working on designs for that, on improving media module. Um, content staging, uh, where we haven't started on that, but we know it's very key. And localization, again, like I said, um, 
we are we're, we're working on that. So um, with that, I, I'd like to pass things over to um, to Jesse, and she's going to show you a lot of you know what we've done uh, in both D7 and D8, and um, you know. Uh, Kind of demo, you know how that's all working, and a lot of it is working incredibly smoothly and beautifully. Kudos to her and to all of the rest of the team for making all this work. I just paint pictures. So I'm trying to figure out how to get this thing to share my screen. I, do I need to pass it to you, or? Okay, no, it's already been. Yeah, let's get that. Let's see. I'm getting. Share my desktop application. Okay. I'm just going to share the whole desktop. Great. Looks like it's being shared. All right. So I'm Jesse Beach. I'm uh, primarily a front end developer, and I've been on uh, the Spark team now for probably eight months since just before DrupalCon Munich. I joined the team. Uh, and I've I've only been in Drupal for about three and a half years now, about the same amount of time I've been with Acquia. So I've kind of grown up with Drupal 8 uh, and um, the mature Drupal 7. So what I want to show here today is not necessarily, or is definitely not, um, the work of just the Spark team. Uh, there are tens, if not hundreds, of developers that have been working on uh, various aspects of the mobilization of Drupal 8. And you know we've had a, a small corner of that, and I think our team has been involved in a lot of that work. But by no means, um, you know, have we have we done possibly even 10% of it. Um, so what we're looking at now is uh, stock D8 head as of this morning. Um, and I just want to mention that um, this might get a little technical. I'm going to show some code, and uh, there might also be bugs. So a lot of the things that we're doing are very much in active development. Uh, you know, there are inconsistencies. We're working to iron those out. And what we're looking at today is essentially the state of the art in terms of Drupal 8 and its mobile support. And there are a couple of patches that I've applied to this uh, demo that are under review or RTPC, but not quite committed yet. Um, a few of them I'm hoping will be committed by the end of the day, so we'll see. Uh, so we're looking at uh, the Drupal 8 demo, and the first thing I want to point out is that the Bartik theme itself from Drupal 7 has been, um, I guess, responsivized would be the best word for it. So if we take uh, what is a desktop size site here and scrunch it down, we're going to start to notice that things change in the um, theme. We'll notice that the primary tabs go to buttons, and then as we get smaller and smaller, We notice that the main content and the sidebar is adjusted into a single column display. Um, you'll also notice up at the top this new toolbar. So we have the primary um, tabs up top and then secondary tabs down below. And this is made to fit within a desktop or as we scrunch this down into a smaller screen. And everything adjusts as we get smaller. And I just want to uh, compare this to the Drupal 7 version to, to really give that um, sense of you know, how different this is. So this is a Drupal 7 site. This is just um, D7 head. And as we scrunch this down, you'll notice that the toolbar kind of um, breaks and wraps in a really ugly way. And one of the other pieces that we have running underneath here, you'll notice in the D7 site that when we scrunch it, the text, the title of the screen here is being overlapped by the toolbar. We have a new tool in Drupal 8 called um, the Displace function. And I can pull it up really quickly. And the displace function is a new tool for front-end developers that allows you to push your content around the screen uh, and out of the way of elements that are pegged to the edge of the viewport, like the sidebar and the toolbar up here. So close that down. 
so the other uh, theme that's been ported over to Responsive View is the seven theme. And let's jump over into an admin view right now. So this is the standard seven admin theme. And I think probably the most um, impressive uh, example of a responsive uh, development in Drupal 8 is the Views UI. Uh, this had, um, I don't think anyone on the Spark team touched this other than when I wrote the CSS for uh, Views 3 like two years ago. Um, but since then, we've had this very complex UI turn into a UI that you could um, work on your phone. Ooh. It is pretty impressive, isn't it? Yeah, the yeah it, it's just amazing. That's actually the first time I've seen that. I haven't really been in views for a while. That is pretty. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. In fact, I mentioned this yesterday, and you were incredulous that it. I, I didn't. I didn't believe it was true, but you know, it is working beautifully. Yeah. It's awesome. So I was when that worked. I was um, also quite thrilled. Um, that's one of the the most complex UIs I think we have in Drupal, and the fact that you can do it on your phone is really impressive. That's really great. And we can look at a couple more of them. So we have here the, um, the new modules page uh, called Extend. And you'll notice there's been a lot of work done to take what is or has been a very overwhelming page, if we were to go back to the Drupal 7 view of this, just to get a good a fairly overwhelming and um, rich page. And back in the Drupal 8 view, we now have information well hidden. And we'll notice that when we take this screen down to a smaller size, the information starts to uh, hide itself so that we can you know, see these uh, fields on a smaller screen. And you'll notice this link right here underneath the core header. When I'm at a larger size, that link isn't there. When I pull this back down, that link becomes available, and when I click on it, it takes what was uh, a complex table and, and shows me that full complexity again. So I can click in. And the idea here is that on a smaller screen, we can hide some information but not make it unavailable and provide the user a way to, to pull it back into view. And this was one of the first um, major patches I got to, to Drupal 8 back in uh, Munich. And if we look at the way that this is implemented, essentially we're setting uh, some classes on the table headers. So we have this um, static variable right here, the responsive priority medium, and responsive priority low. And these essentially map to media queries in the theme itself that hide these table rows when um, there isn't enough room on the screen. And this is done in a backwards compatible way. If you don't include these classes, then the full table in your module will be, all the columns will be visible. Only by adding them do you uh, hide the columns in smaller screens. And there's just a little bit of JavaScript, this little um, table responsive script that has to be included in your module. And with those classes in the script, you have uh, fully responsive tables. That is also very awesome. Yep, and we've got that in the content screen as well. I think this one's a little bit more impressive because we go from a table with a lot of columns, and this is the one that um, I think drove us to develop this uh, behavior because it was just impossible to view the screen uh, on a small device. Mm -hmm. But as we bring this down, we'll notice that we go from all of the columns to the medium priority columns to just the essential columns. Right. And this uh, you know, works well on a small device. Let me see if I can actually it's terrific. bring that up. Oh, Xcode. Yeah. Come on, little paste button. Yep, so there is the screen on a small device. Uh, ignore this little white gap on the side. That's just a little um, bug in the themes. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. All right. So another piece on the mobile front. We've got our list of content here. If we go to uh, the Add Content button, um, 
so I, I think this is one of these forms that is probably used the most in Drupal when it comes to uh, content authors and people's daily interactions with, with Drupal. And most of this work was done, I think, who's it, um, Boyan, Gilroy, uh, and did you say Ryan was working on this? I, yeah, I believe Ryan did some uh, some design work originally on this, but I, I think it probably was mostly Yoroi who did yeah. the design work, and then Boyan uh, did a lot of usability research and in, uh, into you know what the best practices were for this, you know, for for separating out le you know less important options, but that nevertheless need to be there on the screen. So. Yeah, and then Swentel I think was the person who did uh, the primary development for this page. That's right. So again, we have. Um, fairly complex screen that can get more complex as modules add in their separate pieces. Over on the side, we have what used to be the vertical tabs um, displayed now in a details and summaries. So this is one of my favorite additions. And then we see the responsiveness kicking in as the screen gets smaller. Uh, we're now using the details element, which is a newly introduced HTML5 element, uh, introduced, I think, for sort of general use in uh, browsers only within the past couple of months. Uh, and that's come along. And there's, uh, I believe, somewhere down deep a polyfill that gets these details to work on browsers that don't support them natively. But again, we have a nicely responsive UI that works well on a phone. This is one of my favorite screens. I think um, the people that worked on this did a really bang up job on it. It's working really nicely. Yeah. So most of those things uh, were not the primary focus of the Spark team. Those were just sort of uh, very general and very important updates to Drupal 8 that um, get key pieces working on mobile phones, or small devices, I should say. So let's have a look at some of the more uh, focused efforts of the Spark team. And specifically, I want to talk about in-place editing. So let's go back to a front page. So the authoring experience was the, improving the authoring experience is the primary goal of our, our team's work. And one of the aspects of that was to introduce this idea of in-place editing. And what we want to do with in-place editing is allow someone to come in and make a quick edit to content on the screen without having to go into the full edit overlay or form. So we've now introduced uh, these little contextual links, they were, they exist before in Drupal 7. This is just the contextual links module, but we've put in an extra option for quick edit, which contrasts with full edit right here. So when we quick edit, the editable fields in an object become highlighted. And when we click into them, we get uh, the text formatter um, that is associated with your user permissions to edit this piece of content, and we can go in and add something here. Can you show them that in a uh, also in a in a in a in a in a full node because you're in a in a in a in a teaser mode view, so oh, yeah. it's kind of presenting in the in the smaller window. It's a, there's two different kinds of. Yeah. So we just edited that bit. Let me cancel out of that, and we'll go into the full node. do the full edit there. And I think what Kevin wanted to show is that uh, the editor itself goes to the full width of the screen. Yeah, exactly. That's what, that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Marvelous. So that's for content. Um, one of the things we're working on at the moment is the ability to, to quick edit any field in Drupal. Um, the patches for this are still um, under development, but I've got one running live here. So we can quick edit a custom block and this is the body block content for that custom block. Right. Change. And if we refresh the screen, we see that that change is still in place. So we're working on making essentially anything that is a field in place editable, um, including things that have never been fields. Um, there's work underway to make the no title uh, the node author, the published date, all those little pieces that are uh, essentially um, part of the template and, and produced outside of the, um, the field system into fields. Uh, it's a 
touch more complicated than I think I understand, but um, the, when the day comes that they're made editable, well, you know, I'll make them pretty. Jesse, can you show how, how the uh, editing the full node goes looks when you go down to uh, you know three uh, uh, three twenty width? Yeah, definitely. So we can bring that down. Quick edit it, and we see that it's working. And in fact, if I pull that up over here on the phone, let me go to that same. So working side by side on the phone there, and also obviously with um, you know uh, um, with the with the, the CK editor um, you know installed and giving us a nice set of um, options there as well. Yeah, I can't believe I didn't even mention that. So what we're seeing is the CK editor above here, and in Drupal seven we we never had a default um, WYSIWYG editor in core. And what we've done in Drupal 8 is introduce CK Editor as the default editor. You no longer need to go and install a WYSIWYG editor in addition to you know, standard Drupal installation. It's there for you. This is all baked in. The first thing you do when you create your new site is create a node, and everything is set up to do quick editing and WYSIWYG editing. That's great. And that, and that CK Editor toolbar also, because of the way it's separated out into different little groups, which are... Um, inline blocks, you know, breaks nicely when it when it when it goes down to smaller sizes as well and doesn't sort of, you know, act in an awkward way as I, I believe, if I recall correctly, the tiny MC does when you when you get it to smaller sizes, it's kind of awkward. Yeah, it might be. I'm I'm not terribly familiar. All right. So we've talked about that and there's one last feature that I wanted to to show and this one I have to load up really quickly. the responsive preview. So I'm going to show this in Drupal 8. The responsive preview module is available for anyone to download at the moment, and it's it's fairly well baked at this point. So that's at uh, responsive preview at drupal.org slash projects. There's a, a beta release for the 7.x version, and the 8.x version is available um, through a Git clone. And if we go back to that, so um, before you get into the actual um, nitty-gritty of, sh of showing it, um, let, I'd like to just say just a couple of words about Persona because a lot of people have, um, uh, you know, talked about the fact that you know we're presenting uh, we're, we're presenting device names and there's been some you know discussion about you know fluid fluid responsive design and devices not being sort of appropriate um, when we were putting this together. The, the, pers the target persona that we were really kind of thinking about is somebody who's uh, not necessarily a developer or a themer or somebody who's thinking about, you know, making their site responsive across all of these, across, a, you know, a, a fluid range of sizes, which, which we are totally, um, you know, which is totally the ideal in terms of design. But the persona is more the marketing person or the, or the site owner who, or, or the business person who has a specific need to see a site displayed in a certain device because they have knowledge about who their audience is and what type of devices that their audience might be using. So I know, for instance, if I'm, you know, uh, Hasbro, you know, that mo most of my audience is, you know, on Nooks and Kindles or something like that. You know, whereas if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm NBC Universal, it's a very different kind of a, a, you know, an audience. So, so these, so people who are looking at their sites and putting them together and building them, they, th that's not the, that, that's not the same as the person who's theming a site who really wants a, a kind of a, a fluid representation of a pixel, pixel sizes or, or, you know, viewport sizes. This is for users who want to just see. I want. I want to see how my site looks in this specific device, so I can make my content look right in that. And to that end, we've introduced this little menu up here, which has um, just a couple uh, devices by default. There's a discussion going on now about how we can expose this list and make it configurable. 
but let's have a look. Mm. So we're looking so. at what this page would look like in a device that has about the same dimensions and resolution as an iPhone 5. And let's have a look at the 4. We see the um, height reduced a little bit. And we can also look at um, iPad size, rotate that, and all the way up to a uh, typical desktop size for that. And just to give you a sense of what this looks like on a site that doesn't have a responsive theme, um, we have backported this module, as I mentioned, to Drupal 7. That looks so cool. <clears throat> we don't have the toolbar um, injection points to put a you know, nice little drop down up here, so we just have a, a block over here and we can have a look at what this site looks like on an iPhone 5. Uh, Wimlayers did the lion's share of the development for, I guess, um, getting the aspect ratio correct on this so that we can accurately uh, represent what this page would look like on this device by uh, 2D scaling it down from its full size. Look. That's cool. I did not know that. Yeah. So it's not a perfect preview. I mean, there is no, um, there's no substitute for looking on something on a device. Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're not emulating the device. We're not um, trying to tell you exactly what it would look like. But as you mentioned, for someone who wants to get a quick sense of what does this page look like on a smaller device, am I creating a layout in my in my node that's going to yeah. look bad? Where does the headline break? This is what the marketer wants to know. Where, 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 at what word in the headline is it breaking breaking down when it's when it when it's showing on a phone, and where is it breaking where it's when it's showing on an iPod? Yeah. So that's one of the features that will exist as a contributed module. Um, you know, it's in the queue as a proposed feature to Drupal 8, but the the bar to introducing features now is, is very high. So time will tell, you know, what its fate is, but it's available and will be available for inclusion in, in people's projects. Um, great. And in the one minute I have left to chat about these things. I wanted to mention that we're moving ahead with a conversion of many of the JavaScript files in Drupal 8 to the Backbone framework, which is uh, a nicely encapsulated and robust um, model view controller framework for JavaScript. And a lot of these features are already running off of Backbone, and more and more we're, we're getting to the point where we're converting um, previous scripts over to it. And this is one of those things that I feel like is going to be um, extremely exciting to people that are doing front-end development on Drupal over the next three and four years as we move more and more to single-page applications. So uh, driving this underneath, when I click on the iPhone 4 there, the same backbone model that's building this preview right here is also driving the view here that does the drop-down. Sorry, I had to get 60 seconds of geek work. That's, that's, that's super cool. I, I think Backbone is awesome. I mean, I, you know, Jesse will tell you I'm a very much of a novice at JavaScript, um, uh, but, uh, but, but I, I can see the, the power of it and the value of it. It's just, um, it's just uh, really going to you know, provide some awesome stuff for us. So I envy people who can understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to, to show really quickly. That was all awesome. I mean, you know, like I said before, some of that I, I have not even seen yet. My, I've been so heads down in sort of new designs, but um, you know, that is all really working so beautifully. And um, you know, it's just you know when we think back to you know what what D7 or even D6 look like, it's just like a, it's it's we're in a whole new world here. Yeah, this this represents a lot of work. Um, at least two years of solid work by. Uh, John Albin's mobile initiative um, and everyone that's been contributing uh, to that. Um, you know, the Views UI team, I, it's hard to express how many aspects of Drupal we had to touch and, and update to get it to all work so seamlessly. And, you know, it, there's still more work to go. We're, we're in the middle of the, um, the cleanup period where we're getting these disparate functions or, or features that we've introduced to all play nicely together. 
and we're always running into cases where they, they don't quite work well, but I feel like we've hit you know, a good pace of, um, of active development where things are starting to really click into place. Yeah, yeah. It all, it's, it, you know, from from my perspective, just looking at it, just watching it come together, it's it's really, um, it's really beginning to gel, you know, in a big way. But yeah, I think we could we could start to take uh, some of those questions. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that overview, Jesse. I was totally amazed to see some of that. How how simple that is. Um, to make some of that stuff work. Um, and I also just wanted to give you kudos on some of your lorem ipsum tests over on the <laughs> left. <laughs> I don't know how you identified Tumblr, but I'm very interested in seeing what that means. That is a hipster ipsum, if anyone is interested. Oh, yeah. hipster yeah. ipsum. That's great. Yeah. My, you know, I've been going with uh, bacon ipsum for a long time as my default. Bacon ipsum. <laughs> Yeah, but we do have some questions. I want to make sure we get to as many of those as we possibly can. Just trying to get it to open. It was open before. Sorry, give me one second. That does not seem to want to open for me. So I don't know. Actually, Hannah, I don't know if you can get it to open, but uh, that block won't open for me right now. And, and if you have access, it'd be great if maybe you could start in with some of the questions. Ah, I got it. Never mind. Good. All right. So the first question that came in, um, uh, one of our listeners here wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, the displaced uh, work that you were talking about. Can you give um, a more detailed example or point to a resource where there's more detailed example or overview? Yeah. So probably the best place to look um, is the source code of D8. But uh, barring that, I would just say that what Displace is doing is looking in the DOM for elements that have certain attributes. And that attribute is a, a data offset top or data offset bottom. And it goes through the DOM and it collects all of these um, elements that have these attributes and attempts to calculate how far from the edge of the viewport um, something might want to displace itself. These are always suggestions. So there's a, um, an event attached to the document, and your module can listen for that event, and when, when that event fires on a screen resize, you get an object back that has um, displaced values for the four edges of the screen. And your module can choose to use those values to perhaps position itself you know, to the left, to the right. Uh, if I can just share my desktop. Am I still sharing my desktop? I don't think I am. Can you make me the presenter? Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll have to pull that back up. All right. There we go. Okay. So what's happening here? If I open up the structure, the overlay module is implementing Drupal displays in order to know how far from the edge of the screen it should position itself. So this is probably the best place to go look for an example, the overlay module. And as I adjust the screen, the overlay module adjusts itself. Great. Uh, another a quick question here. Where is the table responsive file located? Is that in the seven theme? The table responsive is in MISC, so core MISC. That's okay. kind of like a dumpy ground, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is a dumping ground, indeed. Uh, yeah. That's the Island of Misfit script. Island of Misfit toys. <laughs> yep, they're yeah. my favorite toys, too. <laughs> awesome. Good, and can you compare the Spark and Panoply distros? I think they're complementary. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that, that they don't they don't really um, overlap. You could almost really install one and then install all, all of the modules from the other, and and have like a really kind of you know seamless experience. Um, I, I don't I don't think there are any big over big like um, you know conflicts there. They've done some great awesome work with with layout. It's, they're mainly concerned with you know. Bringing panels to this sort of next level, and um, you know, where while we, you know, you know, had spent some time working with layouts, um, again, our main focus has been this content authoring experience, and 
you know, I, I think that uh, the two are kind of really, like Jesse said, complementary to one another. Great. Um, I was really excited to see the quick edit function. That was really, really cool. Um, and one question we had about that was, does it bypass, uh, boy, does it bypass workflow? Or can you make it work in conjunction with workflow? No, it, it doesn't, by, the, 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 the quick answer to that is, is no. It does not bypass workflow. Quick edit assumes only uh, published content. So in other words, if it's on your site, you can go to your site page and start editing it. Um, it it's not, it's not a, a method for dealing with unpublished content or content that's in, in some kind of a workflow state, another workflow state. One of the things that we're going to start thinking about for as we start working on stuff that's going to be in D8 Contrib for D9 is a more robust workflow solution that perhaps you know goes in that direction. We really have to kind of do some more uh, research, testing, and uh, and design in order to get to that. Though this the the um, the edit in place is really for the for the user who has a piece of published content wants to edit that content in place and then immediately um, save it and have it be live right away. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is it possible so you might be able to handle that with permissioning a little bit? Like, is that particular part of it not maybe available to all your users? Well, there, you know, yeah, there's a lot of ways that you can handle it. Um, you know, I mean, for instance, uh, a lot of users, and certainly a lot of, uh, of our enterprise users would have, for instance, a, uh, a development environment or a staging environment and obviously, if you're editing something which is, quote, live, but it's on your staging environment, it's not really live because, you know, you need to push those, you know, pu push that database stuff up to your live uh, environment and then, and, then, and, and then get that content live. And people use various different ways, uh, you know, methods of doing that, deploy module or workbench, or there's lots of, different, lots of different ways in D7, you know, and there will be a lot of ways, I think, in D8 for people to do that. So... Um, you know, there there are certainly workarounds, but our, our our primary focus was to was to allow people who have live content that they want to edit to edit that content, you know, right in place on their site. Great. And how how much of Spark is in the latest dev version of D8 Core? How much is Spark? Um, I would say that. Anything we're doing with in-place editing, with uh, the toolbar module, with um, yeah, those those to me would be the ones that were the most up to date on the the responsive preview module that I showed is definitely not in uh, the D8 dev at all. It's just a proposed patch at the moment. Um, Okay. So there, I mean, the, to to say those things are in there um, kind of glosses over the fact that there's a lot of code behind that, and we're often working in related modules to get our things to to work correctly. So dealing with fields and dealing with taxonomy and all sorts of of other pieces of code. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and Kelly on the call wanted to know why Backbone versus Twitter Bootstrap, for example. Great question. Um, it's, it's yeah, it's Backbone JS, which is different from from from. Uh, from anyway, I'll let you. I'll let you get, take that. Right. So these two things aren't um, incompatible, and there's quite a lively uh, community around getting a Twitter Bootstrap, a, a module and theme for that, um, ready for Drupal 8. Backbone to us represented the, one of the more mature MVC frameworks for uh, JavaScript. There are others. Um, the the backbone has, I think, the smallest footprint in terms of what it does to your to your DOM. Uh, you know, you oppose that to something like Angular, which, um, if I remember correctly, needs a bit more work in terms of uh, massaging the DOM to get it to um, be able to attach uh, views to the models. And it's one of the, I think, better uh, documented and um, you know, platforms out there. It makes very few assumptions. It doesn't assume a templating language. You know, there, there are just a lot of things about it that make it really light and really simple to use. Uh, you know, that being said, there are 
lots of other um, MVC frameworks out there. And one of the things we're discussing among the JavaScript team in Drupal is, you know, how do we, you know, make it possible to abstract Backbone out if perhaps something better comes along? So, you know, the, we're thinking about modularity even in that, that core subsystem. Now, when you say, what was the, what was the uh, acronym you used? M MVC. MVC. Yes. So I'm not familiar with that one. It's a, it means model view controller. Um, a lot of people call these things um, MVs, just models and views, because mm -hmm. there isn't really a concept of a controller. But uh, I think MVC framework is probably the best um, you know, name for this type of thing. So I had been thinking about Backbone as just, um, you know, as just a JavaScript library rather than like a front-end development framework like Bootstrap or, or Zurb Foundation. Is to, is, um, does, does, yeah. Do they have like, uh, a, you know, a, a full a full framework around uh, around Backbone, or is it just really a JavaScript library? It's nothing like a framework like you would find in Zurb Foundation or Twitter Bootstrap that provides a lot of the front-end layout code and base styles and widgets and things like that. This is really, when it comes down to it, about associating uh, data models with um, HTML on the front end and, and more and more with um, auditory announcements. We're doing a lot with uh, accessibility and hooking into these models that drive HTML uh, announcements, spoken announcements as well, that inform a screen reader user how the, the page is changing. Yeah, Jesse was demoing that to Dries earlier, and it's just, it's amazing. I mean, it literally goes through your entire page and just tells you what, what's there. And even with really um, intricate changes of context, like when an overlay opens or when, when, when different kinds of, um, you know, JavaScript events are fired on the page, it's really pretty cool. Yeah, we'll be talking about that in Portland, me and Wim, if folks are there and want to come uh, to that session. I think it's on Wednesday, maybe Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. Great. Uh, and then also, what what theme have you guys been demoing today? This is just the stock Bartik theme out of Drupal. Okay, great. And are are other widely used themes also going to be as responsive in D8? I can't answer that. I haven't been keeping up with um, theming efforts to update popular themes to D8, but I believe that most of them probably are responsive already, like the Zen theme, and I'm sure. Omega and all of these framework themes. Yeah. I, 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 I'm certain that they all have, you know, adaptive theme, Omegas and et cetera. Yeah. They all have um, been looking at what, you know, what, what's being provided by the new enhancements like Twig, for instance, uh, which is giving a, a new layout um, sort of uh, functionality or engine, I guess you'd call it. I don't know whether that's the right yeah. word. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm sure that they will, that they will all be, um, you know, developing you know, yeah. D8 versions that are responsive. Mm -hmm. Great. And so Spark is already available at the D7 distro. Uh, if you already have D7 site, can you just add some modules to get this functionality? Sort of. Yeah, we're working very hard to make sure that these modules don't depend on anything in the Spark distro. Um, so Wim and I are uh, undertaking an effort right now to introduce libraries module to um, the navbar module, which is the back port of the toolbar, to the responsive preview module to edit so that they can all be used um, independent of each other, um, but when combined, won't be duplicating assets like, um, like backbone and underscore. Okay. And On in fact, I'm running, so uh, right now on my screen, You'll notice I have an in-place edit operations and quick edit. This is just the edit module that I cloned from um, the project running in Drupal 7. This is not the Spark distro. Okay. Cool. Great. And that, um, here's another great question. What about responsive images? Mm. Right. Yeah. That there's work being done on that, definitely. But um, we are not working on that. There are other people who are doing a lot of really good work on that. Yeah. So Addix has been uh, leading that effort with the breakpoints module and the responsive images module. I, I didn't demo that because I didn't have enough time. Um, you know, that that effort I think has uh, larger um, considerations. The the picture element specification or proposed 
proposal for specification is kind of stalled. Um, you know, the, the effort to deal with responsive images at the user agent level is kind of in tatters. And what Drupal 8 might ship with will be some sort of polyfill solution to that, but we won't have uh, an officially supported, you know, updated um, specification for Drupal 8. It just doesn't look like those two projects or those those two efforts are going to align in terms of time. Okay. Uh, another question here is the device simulation already available on D7? Because that was pretty cool. <laughs> and if you ask, where uh, do you find it? Uh, yes, it is. So it's the responsive preview module. Uh, just right there on drupal.org slash project slash responsive preview. And this is a stock D7 site. There's a block that you have to place to get the controls for that. And that's the, the module running in Drupal 7. Nice. Yeah. All right, well, we there are a couple of other there are a couple other preview modules as well. Um, I think two other developers started this within a week of when we started this. Uh, everyone just had the same idea at the same time. It was pretty amazing. So, you know, if there are some other ones out there that I, I think are a bit flashier and perhaps check them all out and see which one you like the most. All right, so we have just a couple of minutes left. Are you guys ready for a lightning round? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Does edit in place work with translation? It will. That's our next but, task. Yep. Okay, great. And where is the best place for novice contributors to jump in with Spark? That is a great question. So we have a couple of... Uh, with the individual projects, if you want to jump into the modules themselves, there are issue queues for each one of those modules. We look at them once a week or more often, respond to them, um, and we really appreciate people uh, logging bugs and patches for the Drupal 7 versions because those inform the development of the Drupal 8 versions. If you want to get involved in the Drupal 8 work, every major effort toolbar edit has what we call a meta page. So if you search for bracket meta end bracket, you're going to find a page where we list all of the sub-issues that relate to those efforts. And uh, those are good jumping off places. So do an issue search for open bracket, meta, close bracket, you know, edit or toolbar, and you'll find those meta issues. Great. Uh, so we still have a few more questions left in the queue. And what I would, I hate to put you on the spot, would, would you mind very much if we collected those and perhaps in our blog post summary, uh, you know, we could show those out with you guys and, and get some answers from from you and, and put those up on the blog post just so we get them all answered uh, at some point. Would that be all right? Absolutely. Not a problem. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we just came to the top of the hour, so I, I really want to thank uh, the two of you, Kevin and Jeffy, for um, a great bit of content there. It's really exciting to, I mean, I've seen this um, previewed a couple of times, but very briefly, it's really exciting to see all of this, that this does. and. Um, you know, for someone who lives and dies on her phone, <laughs> I think this is going to be really great. I want it for the A site now. <laughs> so, so thank you. Um, and, and for everyone else who joined us for today, thank you so much again for, for taking the time to be here. We hope you got a lot out of it. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will post the recording uh, as well as the slides. And now uh, some follow-up to the Q&A from Kevin and Jesse. We'll get those up in a blog post on the DA website in the next couple of days. Uh, so look for those. Um, but if you have any questions in the meantime, you know, feel free to email us. Um, Megan, who's helped uh, get this program off the ground, is Megan at association.drupal.org. And a big thanks to her for helping make this happen. Um, and I can be reached at holly at association.drupal.org. And I will look forward to seeing you very shortly in Portland or wherever else we might cross paths. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. <laughs>